We're going to now consider a little bit about the history of plant systematics and the history of systematic thought. When we look back at a history, we can get a sense of how things happened in a way that gave us our modern world. That is, we didn't just magically appear in this world and the things that we think about today didn't just magically appear in our minds, but they are um, they, ex they exist today because of the history that we've gone through. So a study of history will help us understand why we view the world as we do today, why we view our systematic groups even as we do today, why we classify certain plants in a way today, and why certain types of characters even are used. Most of the histories that we would consider in um, systematics go back to this fellow on the screen right now, and his name was Theophrastus. But really, to understand Theophrastus, who was a student of Aristotle, we have to go back and start with Aristotle, and maybe even a little bit before Aristotle. So here's Aristotle in two busts. He lived from 384 to 322 BC, and I'm not going to ask you to remember any of these dates for the people. I'd like to have a general idea of when these guys lived, but you don't need to memorize the specific dates. You're not going to see those kinds of things on an exam. Well, Aristotle didn't write specifically any botanical works. He did write works on biology and classification, a little bit anyway, but he left it to his student Theophrastus to write the botanical works. So we'll come back to Theophrastus in a minute. To understand Aristotle, though, and how he looked at the world, we really have to go back one more teacher, and that is to Aristotle's teacher, who was Plato. Now, I'm not going to say a lot about Plato. Well, I'm going to say more than maybe not a lot, but I'm not going to give a full lecture on Plato. What we want to talk about is Plato's interest in the world of ideas. Or at least what we would call the world of ideas. For what Plato called this, he might call it then the world of forms. So for what to us looks like a world of ideas, things that exist only in our heads, Plato saw as something that wasn't just in our heads, but was a real existing world. In fact, maybe a world that existed with more reality than the kind of sense world that we created with reality so much. To really understand Plato, I think that the easiest way is to think about his simile of the cave. Now, I usually wouldn't go into this in this class, but I've discovered over years that students don't, not all the students in the class are familiar with this idea of Plato's, and it's a very fundamental, foundational idea in Western culture, and has been influential in Aristotle's thought, and so is influential in all of systematic thought. So I'll spend a couple minutes on it. So this is it the simile of the cave. So what Plato says is that the real world, the world that we see with our senses, is like what, we, what prisoners would see of shadows cast on the wall. So look, here's the situation. So here they're sitting in a cave, and there's a big fire here in the background that provides the light raying out from the fire. And there are some prisoners chained, either in chairs or sitting on the ground. But they're chained so that they have to face forward. They can only look at this wall of the cave. In back of them, <clears throat> between the fire and the prisoners, there are some puppet masters. And those puppet masters are holding models of the table, of cats, or whatever things, all kinds of things that we would see in the world. So there are models here that the puppet masters are holding. And the fire then casts the shadows of those models onto the screen. And this screen then is, for Plato, the sense-perceptible world. the sense-perceptible world. 
Now, of course, you wouldn't see these little puppet masters here in Plato's things. That's an artifact of the way that they did this. You would just see in the world chairs and tables and things. So the chairs and tables we think we're seeing in the world around us, the plants we see in the world around us, are really not the real plants, are not the real tables. Those exist in this other realm, the realm of the puppet masters. <clears throat> and in that realm, the realm of ideas or the realm of forms, That's where reality lies. What we see is just shadows on the wall. Of not anything like what the world is really like. So Plato's world then is really turned away from the sense world. So his emphasis on what's real is not in the sense world. That's very important to remember in this because we're going to see within Western culture a shift away from this idea. The Platonic ideal um, was not taken up in this way, in exactly this way in Western culture. Some argue that Eastern cultures, the Eastern religions especially, take up this idea of the Platonic idea that Plato talked about in this way, this world of ideas, and um, really went with that. And so we see a much more emphasis on the internal life, on meditation, on spiritual advancement, and those kinds of things in the Eastern cultures than we do in Western cultures. Western cultures and the Western church were, and Western science were really influenced by this guy, Aristotle. And again, remember Aristotle was, lived around 384, 384 to 322 BC. For Aristotle, Aristotle started to think about the sense world a lot more than did Plato. So he gave the sense world a more real reality than Plato did. But he was still influenced by Plato. So, you know, all the great students rebel against their teachers, and Aristotle rebelled against Plato, very much so. But he didn't rebel against him completely. He still retains a, uh, a vestige of Plato's thought about the world of forms. So when Aristotle starts talking about classification, and that's the part of Aristotle's thought that we want to think about, he, was very, he wrote a lot of books and um, influenced Western culture more than any other one person in the history of Western culture. Aristotle has influenced it. When, he, when Aristotle thought about classification, he thought about the form of the organism. But he means something a little bit different, the form, than Plato does. Or at least he is putting the emphasis a slightly different way. And this quote we have on this slide it tries to illustrate some of those ideas of Aristotle's. So the quote says, the principal object of natural philosophy. Well, natural philosophy, that's what we would now call natural science. It's not the material elements. So we could kind of think of that as the sense perceptual elements. But I'll give you another example in just a second about what he means by material elements. It's not the material elements, but it's their composition, how they're put together, the totality of their form. There's that word form again, right? So now our, our Aristotle is talking about their form, though, in an ideal kind of way. So we could substitute the word archetype for form here. So it's the way they're put together, but it's not just the way they're put together, it's their archetype that they're put together. This ideal of Plato again, that there's some reality behind the organism that is not just that organism, but is something greater than an organism. And that's what makes it that organism, in fact. Let's see this again by looking at these material elements. And so I had a colleague who used to ask students uh, something like this. He said, well, suppose you take a mouse. Now, we're not, we're not in a zoology class, so let's say we take a, a plant. We take a little branch of a ginkgo, and we put it in a blender. You can see why I didn't want to do this with a mouse. 
and we put the branch of ginkgo in the blender and we turn on the blender and we crush it all up so that it's all mushed up and all we have there is well what do we have there we have ginkgo right we have there in that blender now completely unrecognizable ginkgo but how would we know it's ginkgo I, I know these days we would say well we'd look at DNA and those things but that that's not how you would look at it if you just were looking at this thing with your eye you looked at this mush you would say what is that you couldn't recognize it as the mouse as the ginkgo right so it's the form Aristotle says then that lets us know that that organism is that specific organism but of course if you think about form right now let's look at this example of the carrot so here we have the carrot and we've put it in the blender it's unrecognizable it's carrot juice now and we say well okay that's all right we can still say that this carrot has this specific form and that carrot is recognizable as a carrot because of its form but then we can recognize other things like this these still are carrots but what is their form now it doesn't look exactly like a normal type of carrot so the form can't be completely tied to those material elements that form has to be some ideal that we have that isn't just the shape of the carrot right there's other features here we could say the texture of the carrot other etc you notice now we're not just talking about overall form we're starting to talk about characteristics we're going to come to that as we get more and more material with other systeminists as we go forward even with Aristotle's student Theophrastus we're going to get more and more material about these things but you see the point I hope for Plato even more so but for Aristotle also we see this emphasis on the form the ideal that is expressed in the individual units and it's that ideal then for Aristotle that idea ideal that makes something what it is that makes a carrot a carrot and we recognize it as a carrot because it's a embodiment a specific example of that ideal not specifically because it has a specific shape he's not just talking about shape but he's talking about the overall form of it and the form in an ideal kind of sense well Theophrastus Theophrastus tried to apply these ideas to botany in fact Theophrastus is called the father of botany he produced the first uh, classifications he classified about 480 taxa and he used mostly gross morphology for this so remember now when we started talking about those carrots it didn't look like carrots we started to look at their characteristics so there was starting to be a natural progression from this ideal world to beginning to look at characteristics of the organisms and Theophrastus typifies this so he looks at gross morphology things like are they trees shrubs herbs etc right so gross characteristics of them however he did also look at some more or less cryptic characters so Theophrastus was the first pers person to recognize and write about whether the ovary was inferior whether it was inferior or superior so in general gross characteristics but he did look a little closer in some places like at the flowers and see these recognize superior and inferior ovaries okay so we have now come to Theophrastus he's got 480 taxa recognized based on some characteristics and let's we're going to go on and talk about now the Middle Ages so we're going to have our the first century AD so we're going to jump quite a bit in doing this so there wasn't a lot of um, interest in these types of things after the destruction of Greek culture until the rise of Rome and in the Ro Roman Empire the Romans were interested in things that extended the Empire and brought them wealth and power and medicine was one of those things 
So in the first century AD, we have Dioscorides, who was a Roman military surgeon. He wrote a book on medicinal plants. Most of the healing medicines at that time came from plants. And he covered about 600 taxa in his book, De Materia Medica. Materials for a medicine. So significantly more than Theophrastus, but not anywhere near the number of texts that we know exist today. And this Materia Medica, this listing of the plants with drawings of the plants and their medicinal properties, existed for about 1,500 years and was used for about 1,500 years throughout the whole Middle Ages. I'm sure Discordes did not write the only Materia Medica, but his was the most famous one and the one that's come, come down to us. So he was a utilitarian. It was a utilitarian work. And the people who followed Discordes in the Middle Ages, the herbalists, were utilit wrote utilit utilitarian works. So they were only interested in the plants in as much as they provided herbal medicines. And here we have some pages out of herbals um, written in Latin. And you can see their illustrations of the plants along with descriptions of their characteristics so that they can be identified and of their medicinal properties, which is ma they're mainly what they're mainly used for. The herbalist worked from about 1440 to about 1550 AD. So you see there's a big gap there. 1400 years, 1300 years between Discordes and the beginning of the herbalist. And Uh, they were produced throughout Europe in a number of different languages, which is colloquial languages, but always written in Latin. At a, with the coming of the Renaissance, the herbalists start to fall out. And we start to get a little more emphasis on the material world and in its own, useful in its own right. John Ray is the first of these people we're going to talk about. In order to understand what's happening in the Renaissance, we have to remember that Europe was intensely religious at this point of time. So all throughout the Middle Ages, even before the Renaissance, perhaps even more so than the Renaissance, Europe, where all of this work was taking place, was intensely Christian. Scientists were no exception to this. The well-understood division between science and religion that exists today in the popular mind was completely missing in the Renaissance. It was just beginning to develop this kind of division between science and religion. But for the scientists of the time, such as this guy, John Ray, the first person we'll talk about is an English botanist, wrote the first flora of Britain. But for any of his other contemporaries outside of plant systematics, all of the scientists at the time were intensely religious. And they saw their work in that light. They saw their work in the light of understanding God's creation. So God had created the world according to a kind of plan, the divine plan. And it was man's task through this scientific pursuit to uncover that plan. A classification that uncovered the plan of God was natural. 
So we get this idea of beginning to evolve from the time of about John Ray on. Now, not certainly restricted to John Ray, but I just use him as an example where I bring up the idea. We get this idea of natural classification. Natural classification, the classification that reflects an idea of God's, God's plan that was uncovered by the scientist. Now, this should sound a little bit familiar already. Remember Aristotle and before him Plato, thinking about a divine world in which there was an ideal representation of the species of the taxa. And that ideal representation was what then was reflected in the material world. This isn't so different, and it is no coincidence that it is not so different, from what the naturalists of the Renaissance thought, how they viewed the world. So a naturalist in the Renaissance viewed the world then in a similar way by seeing that this idea then that Aristotle or Plato thought was just kind of out there, that was an ideal that was in the mind of God, and that it was our job as scientists to uncover that ideal. I say it's not coincidence because Aristotelian thought Although it was lost for a long period of time, it was lost to Western scholars, it was not lost to Islamic scholars, and it had gone underground from the West point of view through the Islamic world and was known in Arabic translations and then translated back into Latin, um, or translated into Latin from the Arabic at the beginning of the Renaissance and had a huge influence on the Renaissance and on the church also. So all throughout all of European thought we find Aristotelian thought underlying we saw find Aristotelian thought underlying that thought. So <coughs> so in the Renaissance, we have Aristotle's form or archetype really in just a different guy, in a different guise. But now what happens as we put it in this different guise is that, as has been happening already, there is a continued emphasis on the sensible world. So there's a renewed on the sensible world, or what Aristotle would have called the material elements. Or maybe we could even say on the characters. So on the characteristics of the organisms, we find a much more, uh, a much more stronger emphasis. John Ray, 1600s, 1627 to 1705. His most important work was the first flora of Britain, written in Latin, of course. And this was the Synopsis Methodica Stripium Britannicum. And I'll write it here. erase that. I'm not sure why my why this went back to doing this again. The first floor of Britain came out in three editions. 1690 was the first edition, 1696 and 1724 after his death. He starts to use the idea of a natural group in terms of similarity. 
starts to look at the form sense perceptible characters. So Ray begins to argue that all characteristics of the plants should be used. All of the characteristics of the plant should be used. All the reproductive characteristics, all their vegetative characteristics. You remember that in earlier days, especially you think about Theophrastus, only a few characteristics were used. Only the gross morphology was used by Theophrastus to cl classify the plants. So this idea that all the characteristics are informative of the plants uh, for their classification, this idea of rays is going to be very, very influential. In fact, all nothing is going to be quite the same after this idea was propagated that all, we should be looking at all the kinds, all the characteristics of the plants. We could kind of call this the overall similarity. And we're going to see that term, overall similarity, Again, when we talk about one of the schools of plant systematics later on, the school of phonetics. Pheno means to show, and the school of phonetics is going to be based on ideas of Ray and another taxonomist who we'll talk about in a minute, Addison. And this idea that the phoneticists have with that you should look at all the characteristics of the plants and that you should look at them equally. All the characteristics then comes from Ray. Addison is the person who had the idea that all the characteristics should be equal. But we'll come to him in just a minute. So for Ray, then the natural group of plants were the groups that were, rec were in God's mind and that were recognized by him based on a consideration of all the characteristics of the organism. And this brings us to Linnaeus. His Latinized name, Carlos Linnaeus, came from his Swedish name. He was Swedish, Carl Linné. But it was very common for, not common, but everyone did it at that time, took on a Latin name when they became active as a scientist. He wrote two very important works for taxonomy. The one, of course, that we know went the principles of nomenclature go back to that early work, and that was this one, the Species Plantarum. From 1753. He also wrote in 1773, Genera Plantarum, but we're not going to say very much about that now. Let me just back up for one second and say that Linnaeus was called the father of taxonomy. So Theophrastus was the father of botany and now the father of taxonomy. And so Linnaeus took over a system of nomenclature uh, that existed from before his time, which was based on polynomials. Poly, many, nomial names. So the plants had a polynomial name before Linnaeus, and for Linnaeus also, and Linnaeus used this system of polynomials. But a mechanism that he used resulted in the creation of the binomial. system of nomenclature. So Linnaeus transformed this polynomial system into a binomial system in a way that we're just going to see. So let's look at this um, page from Species Plantarum. 
And we have things here like here's a genus, genus Daphne, and now here's the description of Daphne. Here is a polynomial description. Now I've got a slightly different example I'm going to read to you from another genus. Oops, I was hoping I had a blank page there. And this is the genus Seratula. Seratula. So Seratula the polynomial description, similar to what I've circled in that box there, would be Ceratula, Folius, Ovatus, Oblongatus, Acuminatus, Ceratus, Floribus, Corumbus, Calicisip, Cal Calicibus, Subrotundus. In other words, Cerulata with ovate, oblong, acuminate, serrate leaves, cymose inflorescences, and a subround calyx. So these polynomial descriptions were descriptions of the plant in Latin. The polynomial was a short description of the plant and that was its name. Now it became very difficult to refer to plants by these very long polynomial names and so when Linnaeus was writing his descriptions of the plants he used an index. So there's a little index name next to this. So if you wanted to know which Daphne this was, you would look there and there's a name for it. Or here is Daphne Alpina, for instance. So this index name became, after Linnaeus, the specific epithet. So the specific epithet then originated from a shorthand Linnaeus used in Species Plantarum, a shorthand for these polynomial systems. Michael Adamson is our next important botanist. He was French, I believe, 1772 to 1806. His most famous work Families of the Plants. He recognized 58 families in this treatment and then many of them those families still exist today we would say they still have the same circumscription as they are today. Addison like Ray emphasized the use of all characters but now in addition to Ray he, had, he really said that you sh not just are all characters useful, but you should use as many characters as possible. And not only should you use as many characters as possible, but they are all equally informative. So in other words, they have equal weight. This is a very important point that we'll come back to later on. So the fact is that these characteristics have to have equal weight in according to Addison's system. 
This is so important. I'll write it again. And all characters have equal weight and you should use as many characters as possible. And these are going to be the two founding principles of the school of taxonomy we will talk about in the next weeks called phonetics. And they are not universally agreed on. So phoneticists, after phonetics there was a group of um, taxonomists called the phylogenetic systematists or the cladists. and they didn't agree with these principles. And there were big fights in the literature and almost in person. I mean, I saw people almost come to blows over these issues, and we'll talk about those fights as we go on with our history of taxonomy when we talk about the different schools of taxonomy. But Addison is very important because of these two principles especially the principle that all characters have equal weight. As many characters as possible, that also comes from Ray. Addison just kind of added an emphasis there that they're giving them equal kinds of weight. George Bentham, and the next person we'll talk about, J.D. Hooker, English botanist who wrote very important work, um, wrote the uh, genera plantarum, in 1862 to 1883. It came out in parts. I'm going to talk about a number of works now from now on that weren't just published as one book but were published in parts over a number of years. They now recognized, Bentham and Hooker recognized 200 families and 7,000 That's supposed to be a five, 7,569 genera. So a tremendous increase in the ability to distinguish the different plants. So we've been looking at Bentham now. Here's J.D. Hooker as a young man and an older man. They um, distinguished three main groups of angiosperms, the three groups are still somewhat around today, not quite in this way, but um, they're still influential in how we talk about plants. Uh, the first group, the free petal plants, the polypetaly. And then there were the plants with the fused petals, the uh, we, you know, they should call them the sympetaly, but another word for fused is gamo, so G-A-M-O, gamopetaly. And the third one is essentially our monocotyledons, what we call monocotyledons now, but they didn't call them monocotyledons. They gave them a, a different name, a funnier name, mono, again, for one. But now remember in the lilies and the tulips how there was no differentiation between the petals and the sepals. And so they named this group of plants after the fact that there was no differentiation. So instead of having a, uh, a perianth that was divided into two very distinctly different worlds, they had kind of one world, they, and according to their way of looking at things, so they called it one cloak. And so the um, Name of this group Monoclamidae, Monoclamidae, one cloaked plants. <laughs> 
so a single perianth world. So these ideas are still influential today. We call them slightly different groups, and we don't divide them exactly the same way. Monophyllodes are not a monophyletic group anymore, and they did think of it more as a natural group. So, but it's still influential. We talk about the monocotyledons because of the work of Bentham and Hooker, like this. And this brings us to the theory of evolution and Alfred Wallace and Charles Darwin and the theory of evolution. The theory of evolution is so important because it changed everything in biology. And it changed systematics, but if you have a sense now of what systemists are like, they're very conservative kinds of people, and it changed systematics rather slowly. But after Darwin and, and Wallace and their theory of evolution by natural selection, all of classification's uh, purpose changed. So the purpose before this, everyone we've been talking about up till now, still had somehow behind them this idea of discovering um, God's plan. Now that was much stronger in the early years for Ray than it was for Bentham and Hooker, but still there was this idea of this Aristotelian idea that um, things were immutable and were reflections of some kind of divine world. The theory of evolution by natural selection really was radically different than these Aristotelian ideas. And people began to try to think about, after it became clear that there was some validity to this theory, ways in which it could be um, reflected in evolutionary, in, in systematic thought. So uh, there is one date you need to know here, and that is the date of Darwin's publication of his work, The Origin of Species. And that was first published in 1859. Initially as a paper co-published with Wallace and then published alone as the book, as the full book in 1859 by Darwin. So you should remember that, that date. We now move on to two Germans, Engler and Prantl, extremely influential Germans, worked in the Berlin Herbarium. And they really, their work really made the Berlin Herbarium the world center for botany in the days when these guys were alive. They published a, well, two really main works in German, of course. Now, let me see if I've got a blank slide next. I should have put another blank slide in here because I want to write these two texts on the board. And the first one is um, the natural plant family families, but of course in German. Die Naturlichen. Pflanzen Familien. And that was published in parts again. 1887 to 1915. That's a 1 5. And is one of the really truly great botanical works of, of all time. It treated all plants on a worldwide basis. At least to the generic level. So it looked at all families of plants on a whole worldwide basis, at least to the generic level, sometimes to the species level. The second great work was um, the Plant Kingdom, Das Pflanzenreich. And again, published in parts 1900 to 1953. Uh, clearly, 
being finished up by Engler and then by his successors, but often under Engler's name. So Engler laid out the scope of the work and he um, got other people to contribute chapters to it, and a chapter would mean a specific uh, family of plants, for instance. So oftentimes in uh, Pflanzenreich, uh, Pflanzenfamilien, the um, either in either one, I'm sorry, it was the last time that some families were treated on a worldwide basis. So there have been very few attempts to um, do such a comprehensive work as these guys attempted on this. They had a system, uh, an evolutionary kind of system in their classification, but you know of course since these are books, uh, evolutionary classification at these days meant it was a linear arrangement of the families. They went from the primitive families to the advanced families, but in a linear kind of way, not very close to what we think of as a evolutionary classification today. A lot, a lot of agreement between what they did and what we think of today. But it's been very influential, this classification does, and many herbaria have used uh, the Engler and Prantl classification to arrange their specimens. So the Chapel Hill Herbarium is one of those examples. If you were to go in the Chapel Hill Herbarium and look at the first cabinet that they have, you would find that that cabinet had the first species that appeared in Flotsenfamilien. So it would go the first genera. So it would be organized by the same system that Engler and Prantl used. Now most people today are not familiar with Engler and Prantl's system anymore, except the one exception is the people who work in those herbaria actively, because they have to be to be able to find the things in the herbarium. Our first American is uh, Charles Edwin Bessie. Lived until 1915 uh, and he was our first American who had a major contribution to classification above the species level. Um, Asa Gray was another one of these people. Um, he was a contemporary of Darwin, but Gray's work was mainly at the species level, at describing and cataloging new species, not at making a higher level classification. Bessie was uh, really interesting in that, and so he, we call him the first American with this really true evolutionary classification. But, there's a big but, it, how evolutionary really was it? In terms of what we think of today about an evolutionary classification, um, we would say that there was still a lot of essentialism within Bessie's work. So this word essentialism, I think I haven't introduced yet. But you can see how it would apply easily to Aristotle's work. Um, or to the work of many people after him, an essential group would be a natural group for the older people in the classification, um, like Ray, and it would be something that existed in the mind of God. So Bessie, after trying to follow along Darwin, is trying to make an, a classification that is not essentialistic, but you're going to see, I hope you'll see, that there are still a lot of ideas of essentialism within Bessie's classification. Bessie introduced the ideas of primitive and advanced characteristics into botanical thought. So this is a direct outcome of the kind of thought that Darwin had, that there should be organisms that existed in the past that didn't exist now, and maybe we could say that those organisms had more characteristics that were more primitive than the ones that existed today. Um, this would not be, in terms of the way we think today, correct, but let's just stay with this historical treatment. You can see that, that 
the kind of way that it seems to naturally make sense that the things that are the fossils would have primitive characteristics and the ones that existed today <clears throat> which we do not find in the fossils would have the advanced characteristics. But there are not fossils for every group of plants. In fact at Bessie's time there weren't fossils for most of the groups of plants. We know a lot more today but <clears throat> still not everything about these. So how do you determine if a characteristic is primitive or advanced if you don't have a fossil for it. If you can't look and find exactly that plant or that characteristic in the fossil record. Well, uh, Bessie set down a number of dicta and that's the same word that gives us dictate. So he dictated to the scientific community a number of rules. So <clears throat> rules for determining what was primitive. Some examples. And there's a whole bunch of these dicta. You can Google Bessie's dicta on the internet and find a, a list of them. But here are two famous ones. Woody plants are more primitive. than herbaceous plants. A second one, flowers with many parts for instance many petals are primitive. Flowers with a few parts are advanced. And again, if you look in the fossil record at the time, especially the fossil record that was known at the time of Bessie's work, these uh, characteristics work okay. The, they found that the older taxa, the ones in the fossil record that were known from older times, were woody. And the herbaceous ones appeared later. And also flowers with many parts were found earlier in the fossil record. So there was evidence for these kinds of dicta. The problem came with these dicta is that they became, a, they started to be applied kind of irrespective of the evidence. So that the evidence got separated from the dicta. And that's why they started to be called dictate, dicta or dictates or like kind of um, the kind of proclamation of a dictator. Because as soon as you saw a woody plant, you just knew, according to Bessie's dicta, that it had a primitive characteristic, the woodiness. There was no possibility in Bessie's mind and in botanical mind for quite a number of years after Bessie that something that was not woody could be primitive. Or, and let's say that a different way, that woodiness might have evolved as a secondary characteristic. That is, that there might be some group of plants, um, you don't know that many groups of herbaceous plants let, but let's just take something like the um, sunflower family, which is mainly a herbaceous group, doesn't have a lot of wood in most of the plants. And so if we found some woody members of the, of the sunflower family, and there are woody members of that sunflower family, not common, but there are woody members, we would say, well, we, have, we know that those have to be primitive in this group, and that the herbaceous ones evolved from those more primitive ones woody ones. But it turns out that in many cases is wrong. We know from other kinds of evidence now, DNA evidence, but other kinds of evidence besides DNA, um, evidence from biogeography for instance, that in some cases the herbaceous plants are the primitive ones and the woody plants were derived from those. That woody plants, woodiness has um, been evolved more than one time in some groups. So the problem with Bessie's dict is that they, they did not have the possibility of being reversed and people applied them that way and even when I was studying Bessie's dicta were still um, 
relatively accepted, although they started to be questioned a little bit more during the times of my graduate training. So the problems with the dicta is that they became unalterable. Dicta. Things had were necessarily primitive. primitive. Now again, you can see we've got a holdover from Aristotelianism, right? So we have Darwin coming along and saying that everything is changing, everything is possibly mutable. And if everything's mutable, it should be possible to go from herbaceous to woody, just as well as from woody to herbaceous, in terms of what was primitive to advanced. But Bessie comes along and he has this idea that it's only a one-way street. It's a one, one way uh, that these kinds of things happen. And woodiness, for instance, is always primitive. So it's kind of, it has this idea of essentialism still within these ideas of Bessie. Well, I just want to mention some people after Bessie. We're not going to talk about these guys in any detail, but some more uh, recent workers on phylogeny. Um, unfortunately, all of these people, I believe, have passed away now. Talk to John. I've got an update that has just passed away in the last few years now. Uh, Cronquist was a very important American member of the systematic community, and he developed a classification that of all world plants on the worldwide basis. He did not revise them. He didn't do try to do what Engram and Planto did and do a revision of the worldwide, but he tried to place all families in a phylogenetic system. And we'll talk a little bit more about Cronquist's ideas of that system later on. Cronquist and Toctogen had something very different, I mean, sorry, very unusual in systematic work, and that's they agreed with each other. Toctogen was Russian, uh, Cronquist was American, and they got to know each other and their classifications of the families into a larger context um, were relatively similar with each other, relatively similar to each other, and uh, they agreed with each other pretty well, perhaps because they corresponded, but that's never caused any other scientist to ever agree. So that was relatively striking to people studying their systems, that they thought that there was a higher chance that these systems would be correct, these systems of placing families into a larger phylogenetic context. They must be correct because two people came up with them more or less independently. Rolf Dahlgren was uh, very unfortunately killed in a car accident at a very young age, not quite as young as that picture was there, but um, began to work especially on the monocotyledons and produced a number of works in his middle middle years, just up to his desk, um, that classified the monocotyledons and was an extremely energetic, excited um, young scientist in systematics. Well, the last one I want to group, the last group I want to mention is not really a person at all, but it's been the most influential group in the classification of plants since Bessie, really, and since these guys we just talked about, and this is the angiosperm, angiosperm phylogeny group. They're still currently active, but the composition of the group perhaps changes a little bit. Really, there's kind of two groups of scientists who've gone under this name. Um, and the first group produced the APG1, angiosper angiosperm phylogeny group 1. That's their first classification. And it was based on DNA data. Well, say DNA and morphological data. And on the construction of a phylogenetic tree. So it's based on phylogenetic methods. And in this now, we're really getting away from uh, essentialism, more and more away from essentialism. We can't completely accept it, perhaps, ever. ever. 
every time you identify some plant as a member of a taxon, there is something essentialistic about what you're doing. You say that's Acer rubrum, that's still a classification, and there is that kind of holdover of essentialism there. But as much as possible, that has been um, rooted out of science now and took us a long time, but more or less rooted out of science now. And these phylogenetic methods gives us ways of thinking about the classification of plants. So there's angiosperm, angiosperm phylogeny group classification 1, and there's APG2, or perhaps we should use Roman numerals there. And this is the current classification. That's used in Simpson. So if you look at how the families are arranged in Simpson and the phylogenetic trees that are placed in Simpson, they are based on the work of this group, the phylo angiosperm phylogeny group, too. Now, I don't want to say that it's exclusively their work. They kind of synthesized a lot of work that was done, not just by them, but many other people, and um, put it all together in the in a major phylogenetic tree and published some papers that said this is the outline of the uh, phylogeny of all plants. And this work then is reflected in um, Peter Stevens, uh, APG website at the Missouri Botanical Garden. And I gave you the reference, the URL to this website to use in preparing your presentations. And you'll see that when you look at it, the descriptions, the written descriptions, are very technical on Peter's uh, website. But he's also got a lot of nice uh, links to resources and maps and those kinds of things. And you can get those from his website. But the classification he's got there is the representative of the work of this angiosperm phylogeny group and their second classification, maybe updated now, even second plus classification. Well, where do the people come from? I'm not going to try to name them all, but where, what institutions were involved in this work? Clearly, we have Missouri Botanical Garden. And then the Royal Swedish Academy. of science, and then a university, one of the most the famous, most famous university in, uh, in Sweden, Uppsala University. Several scientists were uh, working on this from there. The Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew in England. Q is spelled K-E-W. University of Maryland. University of Florida. These were the major institutions where um, the scientists who worked on APG2 uh, were from, but other people were involved also in that. It's really impossible to list the number of people. There are so many of them. If you look at the authorship of the APG, the second APG paper uh, that lists the phylogeny and talks about the classification of all the families of plants, uh, there's maybe 30, author 30 authors on it. If you look at Wikipedia and you Google on Wikipedia angiosperm phylogeny group, you'll find a very nice summary of the work of this author, of these authors and what uh, they've done. And I'd recommend that you take a look at that and read those kinds of things. Okay, well that's mainly it then today for our brief history of the classification. We are going to continue with this as we talk about the different schools of phylogeny. And I think all of what we're saying here will start to make more sense as we talk about the different schools. And we will start that up next week.